about the flood, about creation, uh, and other stories had um, older forerunners on which they probably depended. And this discovery led to the foundation of the Religionsgeschichte Schule with famous names such as Gunkel, Rede, and others. And their idea was to understand the Bible in their social cultural perspective and to investigate Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Persian, and Hellenistic influences on the Old and New Testament. So here are some of these scholars. The most famous scholar for us was, of course, Hermann Gunkel. Hermann Gunkel's commentary on the book of Genesis, which is still, I think, a good uh, source of information, constantly refers to parallel between the book of Genesis and Babylonian texts, uh, but also often to Greek mythology as well as German, Nordic and other folklore. Google notes, for instance, that the transformation of Lot's wife into a pillar in Genesis 19 is uh, very much related to Greek mythology. For instance, the uh, transformation of uh, Niobe changed into stone or Cadmus transformed into serpent. However, he's not interested in a uh, question of dependence or borrowing. He says that it's an old oriental count which we have in a Greek and in a Hebrew, in a Hebrew version. After the First World War, this kind of approach was no longer deemed theologically correct. The so-called dialectical theology of Karl Barth insists on the specificity of Christianity and the Bible, which cannot be compared to any other religion. The idea of the incomparability of the Bible did not leave any room for comparison between the biblical text and the ancient Near East. Famous biblical scholars such as Gerhard von Rath, for instance, uh, insisted consequently on the specificity of Israel's faith and traditions and had no interest in investigating extra biblical parallels. And when I was trained in Bible, uh, there was a little bit ancient Near East, but there was no Greece. Greece was for the New Testament. So, a typical example also of this kind of separation is a very influential work of uh, uh, Torleif Bowman. Uh, the Hebrew thought compared to the Greek thinking. And uh, in this book, Bormann, uh, which had several, I think, seven uh, editions in 20 years, uh, in this book, Bormann argued that there is an incompatibility between Greek and Hebrew thought. And his opposition, of course, of Greek and Semitic thought may also have a hidden theological agenda. He claims that Christianity is close to Platonism, and not to the Old Testament, which he uses as a foundation for reconstructing the Hebrew psyche as opposed to the Greek. So, this was the standard view of, very, of most biblical scholars, I would say, until the 60s. Uh, in Jewish scholarship, in Jewish scholarship it was a bit different. Uh, first, I would like just to remind this very important book of Minosis, and this is for interest for you, even if uh, our book had a different agenda as you, uh, he tried to show the differences in comparing Odyssey and Genesis 22, but still he was interested in comparison and also arguing that uh, both uh, kind of mistelling are very important for the Occidental civilization. I think a very important study is the study of Cyrus Gordon, Homer and the Bible, an article and a later book. He uh, <coughs> insisted on parallels between Ugaritic Hebrew and Greek literature, and claimed a common East Mediterranean <coughs> epic tradition, which is connected to the idea that the Mediterranean Sea should not be considered as a barrier, but as a bridge. This is at the time quite a revolutionary story, study, was taken up later by John Perman Brown, whose aim is also to show by linguistic and thematic comparisons that Greek and biblical literatures have much in common. But neither Gordon nor Brown were primarily interested in the question of literary dependency but more, again, in the idea of a common Mediterranean culture. In a way, Gordon was a forerunner of John van Cetus, who in the early 1980s, after the collapse of the traditional dating of the Pentateuchal sources, uh, now used uh, Greek parallels in order to uh, show that his Yavist was indeed a very late author. Van Cetus argued that the Yavis did not write in the 10th or 9th century, but in the Babylonian or early Persian period. And in order to strengthen the idea 
of the Yavis as a historian, he compared him to Greek historians like Herodotus or like Thucydides. Since then, several comparisons between the biblical texts are <coughs> have been done, either in order to argue that the biblical texts are very late, since they are already Hellenistic, or simply to argue for a common mythological tradition from which Greek and biblical narrative arose. This comparison can also include uh, <coughs> more uh, material or philological uh, investigations, as for instance, a very important article of Ibrahim Finkelstein from 2002, where he shows that Goliath's armor in the Book of Samuel reflects the gap of Greek hoplites in the 7th to the 5th century and offers, therefore, a date for the Goliath story. Also, I skip the thing about the Tyrant. So, the more recent interest for the relation between Hellas and the Hebrew Bible is partially the result of the conviction that many biblical texts were written down at a much later period than traditionally assumed. It also relates to newer historical and archaeological investigations according to which the contacts between Greece and the Levant existed already at least since the Assyrian period. It is therefore plausible to assume that biblical text from that period would reflect Greek mythological texts and things. At this point, however, we must introduce a mythological problem. Not every parallel between a Greek or a and a biblical traditions allows claiming direct dependency in one direction or the other. To give just one example, recently Bernd Jörg Diebner from Heidelberg I did my pro seminar with him, so I will mention him. Uh, <laughs> so, Diebner uh, <coughs> argued that the first account of the creation in Genesis 1 uh, was written after 300 BCE because his idea is that it depends on Plato's and Aristotle's uh, uh, idea of the different stages of the soul and should that be for uh, after Aristotle's. Uh, he presents indeed an in interesting synopsis uh, to that show there are some parallels. However, I think it's questionable whether these parallels are strong enough to success literary dependency. Both texts include the idea of a progression from the most basic to the most differentiated and complex form of existence. But this idea may be quite common to an intellectual reflection about the origins of the world. Since there is no closer relationship, this interesting observation of Diebner cannot prove a Hellenistic date for the priestly creation account in Genesis 1. However, as Konrad Schmidt uh, yesterday told us, there may be some more influence in the Septuagint, in the Greek translation, that may indeed depend, at least partially, on the ideas of Aristotle and Plato. The case is a bit different, I would say, for the prologue to the flood in Genesis 6, 1-4. In the catalogue of women attributed to Hesiod, in which it is stated that Zeus decided to destroy the race of uh, <coughs> men because the children of the god, Tecmateon, should not mate with wretched mortals. And this idea may indicate indeed that the author of Genesis 6, uh, 1 to 4, took over this catalogue, or at least a tradition used by the author of the catalogue. Because in the biblical uh, uh, <coughs> text, we have the same idea, and we have the expression Bene Elohim, which may really be related to the Tokmateon. So, uh, it is therefore possible to assume that the author of Genesis 6, 1 to 4, which is now really regarded as one of the latest additions to the flood story, uh, took over this uh, tradition which we find in the Catalog of Women. Here, however, a second methodological problem uh, that resides in the different textual support that we have of Greek and Biblical mythological traditions. Whereas the Biblical narrative is transmitted in a textual form that becomes canonical and whose redactional stages can be dated approximately, the Greek myths have never been canonized and are often available in quite late writings and in many variants. So it is very difficult, also in some way not impossible, to compare these two textual witnesses. In the following, I would like now to offer different kinds of possible relations between Greek and Biblical traditions in order to distinguish between structural parallels, possible influences, and cases where direct literary dependency can be plausible. 
There are some interesting parallels between the book and the Both figures are more mystical than historical, and it is often assumed that the main book there stands for a process of transmission and revision of poetic and epic traditions that became fixed around the 6th century. According to West, Homer is a fictitious name covering a collection of epics and uh, the Greeks of the 6th and 5th century understood by the name of Homer the whole body of the heroic tradition. I don't know if uh, the specialists will agree, they will tell me. The same remarks can be made for Moses and the Torah. The literary shaping of the Pentateuchal tradition started around the 7th century BCE and these traditions were gathered in one document at the end of the 5th or during the 4th century. The Homeric epic shaped Greek culture and identity in the same way that the Pentateuch shaped the identity of nascent Judaism in the Persian and Hellenistic period. In Greece, the end of the middle of the end of the 8th century until the 5th century can be regarded as the age of the lawgivers. And this age corresponds to, corresponds to the time in which the legal codes of the Hebrew Bible, Covenant Code, Deuteronomy, uh, Holiness Code were composed. And there are indeed some interesting parallels between the Greek and the Biblical codes, as shown recently by uh, Anselm Hagedorn. Although the Book of Deuteronomy and its code have often and rightly been compared to Assyrian law codes and Basel treaties, some passages, or at least one, <coughs> let's say one, uh, would fit well with the Greek laws. And this is a passage we have uh, already discussed yesterday. And I just one word, it's uh, the so-called law of uh, the king in Deuteronomy 17.40-20. And uh, it has often been noticed that such a law in which the power of the king is restricted and according to which he is controlled by his brothers does not really fit its ancient Near Eastern context or the royal ideology of the ancient Near East. Uh, Reinhard Achenbach, myself and others now argue that this may be a very late text uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. I will just summarize it because time is running. Uh, this can be a very late text in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, probably integrated after the Deuteronomy was cut up from the Deuteronomistic history in order to allow a little place for the Davidic dynasty, but which is now transformed into a sort of a constitutional monarchy under Persian control or something like this, there's still a king, but he has to obey to the law. And this can be a little bit, maybe, related to uh, Greek uh, <coughs> phenomenon as argued by uh, uh, Hagedorn. He quotes this uh, report of Herodotus that a king has to, uh, to conform to a reform of a certain demonax and so there have yeah, we have a sort of an almost democratic or demotic picture in Deuteronomy 17, which comes can close to, uh, to Greek's idea. But, of course, this parallel with Greece do not necessarily reflect a direct influence from Greece to Deuteronomy 17. I think there's more uh, inside influence from the uh, context of nascent Judaism and the question of the David monarchy. But still, it's interesting to see this parallel. We can, of course, also say that uh, we adopt the view of Karl Jaspers or others and say there's a sort of an excel age uh, in which major philosophical changes appear. It's l'air du temps, uh, it's a sort of a zeitgeist, and uh, so maybe there's no direct uh, uh, relation. But still, I think it's interesting that this text, if it's late, I was very happy also yesterday to hear what you were saying, if this text is a late text, then it can be also compared to some Greek uh, ideas about it. Another, uh, another topic, which is a little bit on the same level, is uh, Abraham going to Greece. Uh, this is a case of Genesis 18 to 19, and you know all this story of uh, the visit of three divine beings in Genesis 18 that has always intrigued commentators. So uh, the church fathers, of course, they had the Trinity there, and then uh, the Jewish commentators, they try to identify the angels and whatever. Uh, it is clear in the present text that there is a kind of uh, attempt to combine Yahweh to three people. So is Yahweh one or is he three? Is he belonging to them? But still there is an identification of Yahweh and the three. And uh, so I think the closest literary parallel can
can be found in uh, Ovid's uh, festivals in the Fasti, which is of course a very late text from the beginning of the first Christian century, but it is always argued that it depends on older Greek uh, traditions. And in this story, which you may know, we have the same idea. We have three, uh, three gods, uh, Jupiter, Poseidon, Mercury, coming to visit an old man. He offers a hospitality, and he has the same problem with Abraham. There's no descendant, and he gets in a more, I would say, material way immediately uh, the descendant. <laughs> so, uh, the parallels are very interesting in my view, because in both cases, uh, the gift of the son is a reward for hospitality that a childless old man shows to God, who he does not identify as such at the beginning of the story. And the divine identity in both cases <coughs> is revealed by the gods, by, by one of the gods, or by Yahweh himself in Genesis. And there's also, in both cases, an etiological interest for the name of the son, Yitzhak and the laughing of, uh, uh, of uh, Sarah, and uh, I let you uh, come back to the other all right, uh, uh, for uh, Uri. So, uh, there may be some relation, but how do we explain this relation? That's the whole problem. It's often argued that we have a sort of a common Levantine Mediterranean tradition. But, as Westermann also said, we don't have any evidence for such a vor-alt-orientalische vor vor Vorgeschichte. There is a prehistory, but we don't have evidence. So, why do we need it? It's a question, so uh, it's also a methodology. And I think we can also try to go even further, because if you look uh, in the Hebrew Bible, we have the number three often related to Mamre and Hebron. And uh, in this text I, you have here, we have three lords of Mamre. Who are these three lords? They are called uh, Anakim, or Anax, maybe in, in Greek, because there's also no clear idea of the, uh, uh, of the root uh, <coughs> uh, Anakim. So, uh, in this case, we could argue that there was a tradition about three eponymous heroes of, uh, of Hebron that the author wanted to, yeah, yeah, how should I say, wanted to make more Yavistic by taking up maybe some Greek uh, traditions. I will skip what I had to say about uh, Lot and his uh, daughters, which can be related to a lot of things, also to Dionysus and wine and the cave and so on. And then we come to another case of dependency, which is, oh, sorry, which is, uh, it's will be short, also Yefta sacrifice and Euripides. This I have argued elsewhere already, that the story of the sacrifice of Chester, of Chester's unnamed daughter, presupposes Greek traditions of Iphigenia, and more precisely, the account of this tradition in the two versions by Euripides. I don't want to repeat <coughs> my arguments, just I want to show you that you can easily show that uh, the story of the sacrifice, uh, we don't have time, so trust me, but I can <laughs> You can check it, if you leave out the red one, uh, you have uh, the old story where Chefta is, uh, is doing a woe, and uh, <coughs> no, it's not a woe, he gets already the, the spirit of Yahweh, and uh, so the woe is a little bit in contradiction because he has already the spirit, why, why does he need to make the woe? So in, in the old story he gets the divine spirit and he fights the Ammonites and everything is fine. So this uh, story of Iphigenia is not really necessary to the old uh, story of Chefta. Uh, what is interesting is that the history of the tradition of Iphigenia is also complicated as a lot of biblical tradition histories. Mm -hmm. So nobody knows really where Iphigenia comes from. <coughs> uh, we have them, we have the Kipri of Stasinos, and then, of course, we have them in uh, the both version of, uh, <coughs> of uh, Eurybixis, where the end is different. Once it's uh, with the substitution, and once she is really sacrificed at the at least what the specialist says in the Aulis version, apparently there was an old ending where uh, she was sacrificed. So, it is therefore quite possible that the author who inserted the story of, uh, about Chapter's daughter into the book of Judges knew the Iphigenia tradition according to the Eupitis. So let, let's just speculate a bit. 
he could go to Greece, where he assisted to representation of Iphigenia, or to Milet, or he had access to a written form of one or both plays that were circulated in written form among literary members uh, of <coughs> the audience and performers at minor festivals. Since the text at that time was not stable, we cannot be sure in what precise form the Iphigenia tragedy was familiar to the author of Judges 11. But apparently, he knew both endings of the story because in the biblical account of uh, Judges 11, there is some, some uh, ambiguity about the ending of, uh, of Jephthah's daughter. So rabbis have always argued that he was not really sacrificed, he stopped. So, uh, <clears throat> I would just like to show some parallels between the biblical and the uh, uh, European version of this sacrifice. In <clears throat> both cases, Iphigenia and Judges 11, the role the is made in the context of a military crisis. In Iphigenia, as in Judges, the girls are running joyfully to meet their father, and both father then are complaining about their fate, accusing their daughters to bring affliction about them. In Iphigenia, as well as in Judges 11, the girl is acting in a heroic way. They accept to be offered a sacrifice, and they exhort uh, their respective father to do so. And in both texts also we find the idea of a commemoration of the young girls offered in sacrifice. So, the final of the biblical narratives also reminds of an Ignatian festival at Brabron which was bound to the myth of Ephigenia and took place every four years. We, don't know, have, we do not have any indication that such a ritual existed in Judah. Therefore, we may conclude that the biblical author transformed the ritual into literature. So, I find it plausible that the story of Jephthah's daughter has been written around 350 BCE as a supplement to the Jephthah story. Maybe the redactor wanted to bring the hero story of the saviors and judges closer to Greek tragedies. Maybe he had also thought of a theological agenda, like to show that the gods are away <coughs> from, the, uh, from the human, like Hohelet, for instance. He's quite close to a comment. So another question just I want to ask. Did the addresses of Judges 11 need to know the Ephigenia myth in order to, stand, uh, to understand the story of Jephthah's daughter? Probably not. But with uh, Rifater, one could speak of a random intertextuality. The addresses can understand the story for itself, but the educated addresses, interested in the Hellenistic culture would gain a supplementary meaning by understanding that Jephthah's daughter is indeed a Hebrew Iphigenia. Recently Walter Cross in his commentary on Judges uh, quoted this and said this is very unglaubwürdig. It's not very really, uh, believable. But I don't know why. Because he did not offer as far as I can see a better explanation. So Greek influence on Judges 11 seems therefore the best option. The Red Alec did not copy from a Greek text for sure, but he had quite a good knowledge. And I would like now to conclude this short investigation with another text from the Book of Judges. And there, there we have literary parallels. And this is uh, <coughs> Chotam's Fable and Aesop. Uh, I skip the things about Aesop. The specialists know all this. We don't know if he lived or uh, what he really did when he was collecting his fables. Uh, but uh, often scholars assume, at least what I understood, that in the 5th century there existed a collection of fables attributed to Aesop, but until now no material evidence of such a document has been discovered, but it became apparently a very, uh, <coughs> a very uh, popular uh, idea. So several collections were made in Greek and Latin, and it's uh, difficult uh, about the manuscript, so uh, it is often argued that the first collection go back to and the question is now, if you look to this post text, compare the fable of the trees and the olive and the Jotam's fable in the Book of Judges. There are literal parallels. This cannot be just by chance. And this cannot be a common old tradition. Or you have to, to say this is a very, very stable oral tradition. So there must be some kind, one way or another. So I think these texts are so closely related that either Judges 9 depends on the Aesop fable, or vice versa, or... or